Welcome to WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV Channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle, Loyola's premier sports talk radio show, airing every Monday and Friday from 3 to 4 on Mondays and 1 to 2 on Fridays. Welcome into a Friday edition of the show. I am your host today, Jerry Bozzi, and we've got a lot to dive into today, but I'll introduce my co-host as always, Jimmy Cody. Jimmy, how's everything going? Uh, everything's going. Oh, my mic's not on. Oop. There you Try go. Now. There you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. On. Wrong button. Wrong button. It's I'm off okay. to a slow start. It's okay. You're, you're good. Uh, yeah, I am good. I'm happy to be here talking some sports with you again. Um, you know, that's always a fun time. So glad to uh, glad to be here. Yeah, so we have a lot to dive into, like I said. And we're going to start with the World Series. And Game 5 was last night between the Houston Astros and the Philadelphia Phillies. And... In short, the Astros ended up going out of Philly with a 3-2 victory, and now they lead the series three games to two as the series shifts back to Houston for game six and, if necessary, game seven. And it was a wild three games in Philly because I think we talked about the first two games in Houston, but I'm not sure if we talked about many of the games in Philly because the one game three was postponed and then the schedule was a little mixed up, but... Mm -hmm. In short, the Phillies won game three, seven, nothing. It was just an offensive explosion with home runs just happening all over. And then in game four, you saw the Astros make history with the combined no hitter. And then game five last night, a really dramatic game, which I feel like we haven't had a lot of late game drama, or at least the game hasn't been close in the late innings, maybe besides game one. And the Astros found a way to hold off the Phillies and win three, two. So I guess, Jimmy, we obviously watched the game last night and the other games as well so I guess what are your thoughts on last night's game obviously it's a gut-wrenching loss for the Phils and for the Astros to get two out of three in Philadelphia it's huge obviously coming back to Houston with a chance to close it out tomorrow night what are your thoughts overall on what you saw what did you like not like whatever you want well I'm I'm sure that you have plenty to say about this topic but I guess the story for the Phillies is missed opportunities last night too many guys left on base, um, and, and I didn't even think the pitching was that bad for them. I'm going to be completely honest. I thought Noah Syndergaard kept them in the game. I thought the bullpen did a pretty good job. Um, the Phillies just could not take uh, advantage of the opportunities that they put themselves in. And that that they, they essentially shot themselves in the foot by not being able to drive runners in, and it really costed them because – there's no other way to say this. Uh, just from an outside source, I know Phillies are not, you know, the outside view, the Philly fans don't want to hear this. But it's not good that the Astros are going back to Houston with the league. I mean, I, oh, I, no I, I, you guys, I literally said, I thought that was the one thing you could not have happen. And it has happened. Yeah, I felt like last night was a must win. And they didn't get it done. And I completely agree with you bringing up the whole missed opportunities point. I think there was a stat and... The stat was that ended up being broken last night, but I think going into the late innings of that game, the Phillies, I think in their last 20 at bats with the runners in scoring position, they didn't get a hit on any of those at bats and they weren't able to drive in any of those runs when they had a runner on first or second and third, excuse me, until I believe Gene Segura did it in the eighth inning, which cut the lead to three, two, but I completely agree when you say they shot themselves in the foot, the pitching I mean, it gave them a chance to win. Listen, and that's all you can ask for. Yeah. We know game three was all Phillies, but game four, obviously, Nola came out a little shaky. But lot, even last night, Syndergaard goes, what, three innings? Doesn't really allow too much. Obviously, he gave up the. He gave up two runs. Two runs, which I guess that's not ideal. But the bullpen that came in after him, you talk about Connor Brogdon, Jose Alvarado, and. Sandy Dominguez was a little shaky, but Robertson and Eflin, they did their job and they held the Astros to only three runs. And then it's a shame as Phillies fans just to see the offense go in a drought like this because you wouldn't think this would happen. It was a complete role reversal, I think, from game three. You saw the team combine for five home runs, places rocking. And then all of a sudden, the next night, the Astros come back and they throw a combined no hitter, which obviously you got to tip your cap to them, but it's just obviously stunning to see. And then Last night, like you said, they just had chances to score. And it's funny because I felt like early in the series, Houston was in the same position where they had a lot of guys in second and third. And I thought this is especially true in games three and four, and they weren't able to drive in runs. Now, in game four, they ended up with five runs. But I feel like early on in the series, Houston didn't really do much with 
guys in scoring position. They had a few home runs, but now you see the Phillies being unable to cash in. But yeah, this is a tough loss for the Phillies. I think going back to Houston down three two, obviously it's the last thing that they wanted. But we'll have to see tomorrow night. They have Zach Wheeler on the hill against Framber Valdez. I guess going into this game, Jimmy, I guess who do you give the edge to? Well, right now I give the edge to the Astros. That's just the way it is. Um, the Phillies, no offense, but I thought the energy last night in the stadium felt like it had been sucked out. Especially once it was a little Astros, deflating. Yeah, it was deflating. Um, I want. There's another thing I want to mention too. If you took away Alec Bohm and you took away Gene Zagura last night, and you had two hits from last year lineup. Yeah, Rio Muto was not great. Listen, he had a him and Hoskins hard hit ball in the ninth, which him, was caught by Chas McCormick. Him, Hell of a play. Ha- Hoskins. Real Muto, Cassianos is killing you guys right now. Yeah, they're an out every single time those three step up. All those late. guys are batting in the heart of the order. Yep, and they're an out every single time they step up. Yeah, and even Harper last night with the two walks, he still finds a way to get a base. And Schwarber, I mean, he had the he, leadoff yeah, home run. Home run, run yeah. kind of set the tone. You thought maybe this could be a good night. Maybe it'd be like that's game what three. That's what you're asking for, Schwarber. Get us a home run, and that's exactly what he did. And he got on base one other time, but yeah. When you have guys in the middle of the lineup like Real Muto and Hoskins and Castellanos not doing anything, and I mean Alec Bohm too, for that matter. Well, Alec Bohm hit two for what two he, for four. So. Right. Yeah. I sorry. I read a zero in the box score. It was wrong. I meant to say Bryson Stott. Bryson Stott had zero hits. Yeah, but Bryson Stott is the rookie shortstop. He's not the guy right. you're paying all this money to, like Real Muto and Castellanos. And then Hoskins is obviously a core player. Um, those guys need that's, to that's the up. problem that's yeah. the problem yes and assuming that the Phillies stick to their trend of their lineups I think they will probably sub out Bryson Stott and Brandon Marsh just because Valdez is a left-handed pitcher so they'll probably sub in Edmundo Sosa and Matt Reeling, but we'll see we'll it's also do see. or die on Saturday yeah so I'm curious what the Phillies are going to do pitching wise because obviously best case scenario is Zach Wheeler goes the distance, goes seven, eight, even nine innings perhaps, and just takes them all the way to the end of the game. But yeah, using a lot of bullpen arms last night was probably not ideal, but they did their job. It's just, I don't know what more you can ask of the bullpen. The offense just needs to get going. Yeah, no, I mean, three, two, you're telling me, you're telling me the Astros were only held to three runs by the Phillies pitching. Um, I, I would definitely like the Phillies chances there. Yeah, and even in game four, I know the Astros put up five, which I guess that's a hard number to catch up to sometimes, but the Phillies obviously were shut down by the Astros pitching. I think that was just a world-class pitching performance, but it's just been such a wacky series. I mean, you can go back to even game one. Houston goes up 5 nothing. They're unable to hold the lead there, and they lose 6-5. Game two, they get up 5 nothing. They're able to hold that lead. And then game three in Philly, the Phillies jump out, and they win 7 nothing. Uh, there was no signs of the Astros catching up in that game. And then game four, complete shutdown pitching performance for the Astros. And last night, a tight back and forth game, and then Houston was able to hold on. So it's been a really weird series in the and, sense that one team goes up, and then, I don't know, one team can come back, and then one team goes up, and they stay, and they hold the lead. Here's another thing, too. I didn't even think that the Astros pitching, starting pitching, came out and was, like, great. I was not, like, super impressed with Berlander. I didn't think that he was – you know, awesome and dominant and was like the reason that they won. I mean, this was a game that the Astros really had to fight for. And I think that's what makes it so much tougher for the Phillies is because they know that, you know, they really, really, really just did not have it with a lot of guys in their lineup. And it's, it's things. Yeah. And I felt like Cassianos was always up in the big moments and just could not get a hundred percent. He was always up with a guy or two on two outs, just need a little single and you probably tie the game or cut the lead to one, which they did, but. Yeah, they just weren't able to get it done, and they meaning the middle of the order for the Phillies. So, yeah, it's do or die tomorrow for the Phillies in Houston. I have some faith that Wheeler can hold down the fort in the sense that he can go deep because he's, he's, he's the guy you want he's on the perfect there. guy for the yeah. Phillies to have out there. And I guess the same might be able to be said for the Astros because Valdez is a guy that has a lot of really good off-speed pitches. He can really throw hitters off uh, their place, but We'll see. It's going to be quite the pitching matchup down there in Houston. And yeah, for the Phils, they need Wheeler to go deep or else their season's going to end. So, yeah, I think we'll wrap that up there. But speaking of Philadelphia and Houston, <laughs> there was another Philadelphia-Houston sports game last night. We're going to jump to the football side of things. And 
This was the Thursday night football game down in Houston between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Houston Texans. It's not the most appealing matchup on paper, I would say, but it was actually kind of an entertaining game. Uh, we obviously watched that game as well. And I will say the Texans put up a really, really good fight. For Especially a, in the first half. For a team that has one win, they're not really expected to do much this year. They put up a pretty good fight, and they actually came down on their first drive. They marched right down the field and scored, and they jumped out to that 7-0 lead. And then you saw the Eagles respond and tie the game. They took the lead, and then Houston ended up tying it at 14. It was 14-14 at half. And yeah. even in the third or going into the fourth, Houston's only down 21-17 before – Jalen Hurts found Dallas got it for a touchdown, which ended up kind of icing the game. So the Eagles held on and beat the Texans 29 to 17 to move to 8-0. And I don't know what were your thoughts last night because I felt like I don't know. Mine? Oh, I don't have anything positive to say about the Eagles. I really didn't think they played that Because well. they kind of, I don't know what the word is. Maybe it's like sleepwalk. They kind of sleepwalk through sleepwalk is a good way to describe it. The first the defense, half. But... The defense, I thought, slept well. I thought the offense was fine. I thought they did what yeah. they needed to do. You put up 29 points. I mean, they could have looked. I thought the offensive line, there was a couple of plays where it seemed like it was jailbreak. I didn't know it was a little, not the best offensive line. I mean, Jerry Hughes at one point was like lighting you guys up in the first half. It was, it was definitely a subpar game from Mylotta. Jordan yeah, Mylotta, no, that left was, tackle. Not a, I did not like what I saw from the Eagles at some points last night, specifically when it came to stopping the run. They were not good at stopping the run. Damon Pierce was able to run all over the field. I mean, he had 27 carries. For 139. I mean, that's a lot of yards. Yeah. And then the killer thing for the Texans is really the two interceptions. I mean, obviously. They're going to need a quarterback. Like, it's just the truth. Unfortunately, Davis Mills yeah. had a good rookie season and looked like he could perhaps be a piece. Um, but year two has not been the same to him, for sure. Uh, and it's unfortunate, too, for him because he was obviously in a little bit of a different offense last year. Right. But I was just going to say, when you're throwing two interceptions, obviously it's not going to do well for any team. but when you give other opposing offenses like the Eagles who can score. And the other thing for the Eagles that was a little encouraging as a fan was they put up 14 in the second half and we've known they've struggled mightily. To well, they had to or else they wouldn't have won in the second half. And they found the end zone twice in the second half. So that was definitely a little encouraging, but yeah, I thought the offense was fine. I thought it was pretty solid performance from the offense. Yeah. I, I'll give you the defense. The four defense. sacks, the four sacks is concerning. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not like your own line. You didn't expect that. That's not something that you've come to expect. Right. I don't know. It was a weird game. It, it was a game coming in where you would expect them to win because the Texans are just not a very good football team. I mean, I'm just going to say it here. I mean, it's easy to say when you beat the team, but I don't know. No, they're not a great team. They don't have a lot of they don't have a lot of firepower. And also, they did not have Brandon Cooks, who was obviously a big part of their team. He was out. Was he injured? No, nope. personal decision did not, or coach's decision did not. Play so I wasn't sure decision. because he's been ruined in trade talks. Yeah, he wanted to be traded, was not traded on the trade deadline. And so the coaches, he fired off a tweet that was like, I don't know, he's sick of essentially being here and just saying that he wants to be here when he doesn't. It was like something along the lines of that. Uh, it was very bizarre. He was like, it was in cryptic, of course. It was like, you know, where he doesn't actually come out and say it, but that's essentially what it was. He wanted to be traded. Yeah. I guess the moral of the story here is the Eagles kind of, I don't know. They have some things to work on. They walked through sure. the park last night. They got hit a few times, and then they found a way to get out of there with a win. And moving forward for the Eagles and the Texans, the Eagles will play Monday night in Week 10. They host the Washington Commanders, and then the Houston Texans, they will travel to MetLife Stadium to take on the Giants on November 13th, which is week 10 as well. So those are the next two games for those teams. But I was looking at the slate here, Jimmy. I'm not sure you took a look at the slate this weekend for games. Sunday. And it's not a big slate because there are some teams There's on a lot of by teams week by. Because I was looking here, there's only two games in the four o'clock window this week, which is kind of odd. And only one of them is uh, the 425 widely shown game, which is the Rams and the Bucks. Boy. Yes, oh, and even more exciting than that, everybody gets to watch two teams who are sleepwalking through their season, essentially. Well, it's crazy, too, because coming in the year, you would think this would be a blockbuster matchup, must-be oh, yeah. TV matchup. you got the Super Bowl champs going up against Tom Brady and the once Super Bowl champs, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Even the well, other... it was a great game last year. Right, this is going to be the rematch of the divisional round playoff game where L.A. got off that huge lead in Tampa Bay, and then Brady was mounting one of those 
unbelievable comebacks, which we've seen in other places before, a la the Super Bowl against Atlanta. But I was going to say, even the 405 game is good, the Seahawks Cardinals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with you. I think that's a very interesting game for the Seahawks, depending on whether or not they can win there. Um, I, I, there's a lot of games that intrigue me. I mean, hey, look at the Falcons. They, they're getting a, a contender come into home. Let's see how legit the Falcons are. I think if they win that game, like, I start taking this team seriously for the playoffs. Yeah, so I guess we can start going through the slate right there in Atlanta. The Falcons are hosting the Los Angeles Chargers, and I believe the Chargers are coming off by, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think they had a game last week. So they did not. They are going to be well rested. We'll see how they travel from west to east because I know, Jimmy, you bring up that point a lot. I do think that's true. Teams from the west coast traveling to the east, it's definitely. A different factor playing especially the chargers that they travel game. absolutely horrendously i mean we saw how flat they came out in baltimore last week i would not and we saw the raiders last week go to new orleans and just were completely flat too for a one o'clock game this is something that happens i have no idea if you know the chargers are going to be ready to play but i'll tell you right now the falcons at home are a sneaky good team they play really good ball at home and I think they're going to try to ride the momentum that they got last week from beating Carolina. And I know Carolina is not a great team, but that game was somehow for first place in the NFC South. And now the Falcons have first place at four and four. So they're going to definitely want to keep it going. I had to pick the game. That's a tough one. But there's a lot of guys injured too. We have, we have got to mention this because this, we do not know if Keenan Allen's going to play. Um, that is a huge, you know, question mark there for the chargers. And we also know that A.J. Terrell, the star corner for the Falcons, is going to be out of, as, again as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of question marks on this field. Like, this is a game that I think can go any direction, just be based on so many circumstances, which we don't know the answer to. So, I was going to add to your point about the injuries. Austin Eckler and Donald Parham Jr. are also questionable. Yeah, start, an offensive starter. The Chargers, yeah. so... It's a tough game to pick. I don't know if I can actually pick it right now. Just I would honestly, I mean, I would say if both teams are somewhat at full strength, I just think the Chargers have a little more offense than the Falcons do. But I don't know. Uh, I know this is crazy, but I'm going to take the Falcons. Uh, I just think that at home they're a much better team. I mean, we saw they what they did to the 49ers at home. We saw what they did to a team like the Browns at home. I mean, gosh, they can they can play against teams like they are not. They're not your pushover Falcons anymore. This is a competitive ball club. I mean, on the road, they're not as great. That's just the truth. I mean, they just completely no-showed when they went to Cincinnati. It was not a great effort. Um, but And they also, unfortunately, lost to the uh, Buccaneers on the road. But this is a team who beat Seattle on the road. I mean, they, they can play like... I wouldn't be surprised if the Falcons win. I really don't yeah, think... Yeah, they, they also are. put up a dogfight against the Rams in Tampa Bay. They can yeah. play. I mean, they can play. They're they're in every game. They've, they've essentially been in every game. And uh, off the bye, you would think the Chargers would be ready to play and there'd be no excuses. But it's the Chargers. We don't know what we're going to get. Yeah, and this is also a big game for the Chargers, too, because they're still in striking distance in the division with the Chiefs because the Chiefs are at 5-2. and two. So it's definitely a game they're going to want to win to keep pace with them. But another team that is located in the southern part of the u.s the miami dolphins they are traveling north to the windy city to take on the chicago bears i actually think this is another game where i think a lot of people are going to take the dolphins i could see the bears keeping it close because the last few weeks their offense has kind of come into life a little bit but i just think tua and tyree kill and Jalen waddle and we'll have to see about their new additions as well we should mention that there was a crazy trade deadline in the nfl that happened on tuesday a lot of familiar faces going to new places so yeah the dolphins were able to acquire bradley chubb from the from the broncos and then That's very big yeah game. so actually if you want to speak on that because obviously that impacts your team you the trade, guys got I mean, chase edmonds and i believe some draft picks but you could offer some thoughts in the yeah, how so that trade went down for the it, dolphins and the broncos yeah we can talk about that trade really quickly i personally thought honestly good trade for both sides miami needs a pass rusher and they were willing to give Bradley Chubb an extension. So by all means, I'll be that's that's great for them if they wanted to do that. We got a first round pick in return, which I think is fair compensation for a good pass rusher. Um, and we also have other pass rushers on our team where I feel like we're still in a decent enough spot on that in that area where I don't think it's going to affect our performance. Um, truth be told, Bradley Chubb has started the season with a lot of sacks, but recently 
You know, his sack numbers haven't been high. I believe he's at six for the season, which is a pretty good number through eight games. I don't think you could ask for much more. Um, I don't know how much he's going to be used this week, but I assume they can definitely use him in, you know, pass rushing um, situations. And, and the Bears' old line is not good. So I wouldn't be surprised if he has a big game for them. I think the ultimate thing, though, for the Broncos was they didn't know if they were going to 100% resign him because this was his fifth year. And they also just knew they could get a first round pick for him. I mean, we signed Randy Gregory, right? That's a lot of money going to a pass rusher. So I think if you sign Randy Gregory for a little less, and you know you have other guys like Darren Browning, who's playing really well, you don't really need, you don't, it's not as necessary to resign Chubb. So I don't hate the deal. And also, I think it's interesting that we got Chase Edmonds. I'm very interested to see how he gets incorporated into the offense. But as for Chubb going to the Dolphins, I think it's exactly what they need. They need a pass rusher. They're not bad at stopping the run. Their corners aren't bad, but they just don't have a great pass rush. So that's something that concerns them. Um, and I, I think they fixed that area. I mean, if you want me to ask or talk about another area, I think the Dolphins should try to fix. I mean, their O line is eh. It's just yeah, an it's an, not great. It's just an an O line. It's it, I don't think it's bad, but I don't I don't think it's I definitely don't think it's good. Like I think it can definitely get beat. Um, but, you know, the Bears also in this specific game are a tanking team. Like, that's just the truth of the matter. They're, they're a team that's more than likely not going to have the super high pick. They're just trying to get young guys out there like Mooney and uh, Fields. And they're trying to really, you know, have their progression be better as, as their career gets started. Um, this is a game the Dolphins should win. I think you'd agree with that. Yeah, I just think they have too much offense. And you bring up this trade deadline stuff where the Dolphins and Broncos made a deal. The Bears made a few moves. They traded away pass rusher Robert Quinn, which was pre-trade deadline to the Eagles, and they received some draft picks there. And they also acquired wide receiver Chase Claypool from the Steelers, which was a little interesting, eye-popping move. I didn't really see coming, but... And they also had Roquan Smith. And they dealt Roquan Smith to the Ravens, which is a huge deal, I think, for both teams, more so the Ravens, just because they're trying to go for it now. I think it's a great addition for them, but the Bears got some big picks back from that deal, so I think it's a win-win for them and the Ravens. But yeah, I just think the Dolphins have too much offense. I feel like the Dolphins haven't missed a beat since Tua has been back. Like whenever Tua is on the field, they're expecting the win, and they've done just that. They're undefeated in the starts this year, I believe. They also right? don't really have that many injuries. Like, no, they've had, not, injury nobody, they've had good injuries. They've had good besides injury the quarterback, but yeah. Besides, I mean, everywhere else, though, they've been kind of okay, especially with the receivers. I mean, they have some very good receivers out there. And I think they're going to be around later in the year, perhaps in January. I think they're a team that could maybe sneak up on people in the AFC because you talk about they're lurking. You talk about Buffalo, you talk about Kansas City, you talk about some other teams. I think they're a team that could really sneak up on one of those teams and a lot of other teams that they could really make some noise. But especially with their offense, too, just because of the big playability it has, you know. We saw teams like the Bills. The, think about who were the best three teams in the AFC last year. Bills, Chiefs, Bengals. What do they all have? High-powered offenses. What else do they have? Yeah, I was going to bring up the Bengals, too. Not great yeah. defenses, right? Not, they're all not that great. Like, they can definitely score on them. Well, the Dolphins, as we know, they've already beaten the Bills once this season. They can certainly put up points with those teams. And the other trade deadline deal I should mention that the Dolphins made, they acquired running back Jeff Wilson Jr. from the 49ers. So that reunites him with former Niners coordinator Mike McDaniel, who is now the head coach of the Dolphins. So definitely some familiarity there. And I think it might be a nice way to slide him right behind Raheem Mostert. And Raheem Mostert obviously used to be with Mike McDaniel in San Francisco before they both went to Miami. So great stuff there from the Dolphins trying to upgrade their offense. But yeah, I was going to stick to another AFC team that obviously made a lot of noise last year. They made the Super Bowl, but kind of been finding their way this year. They started to find it. The Cincinnati Bengals. They they did not find it on Monday. No, they did not. So That was not good. The Cincinnati Bengals, they come into this game this week. They're hosting the Carolina Panthers, and Carolina's coming off a tough loss in Atlanta, but they're still in the thick of it in the AFC South, or NFC South, excuse me, believe it or not. But, yeah, you bring up the Bengals. They are coming off a just terrible performance in Cleveland. They got blown out by the Browns on Monday Night Football, 32-13. And we both picked Cleveland, and you were right on the money. Obviously, Jamar Chase, he is out for the next few weeks. And Joe Burrow, I think, missed him a little bit. And I think it showed just with the points. They only scored we could talk about 12, their 13 points. We whatever could talk it was. about their offense all day. Their defense cannot stop a soul. Yeah. And I mean, they I could think... not stop the run to save their life. It was like a complete joke. Going up a 
against a quarterback like PJ Walker might have a little bit element of surprise. You never know what you're going to get. I mean, it could pose some problems for them. But despite all of that being said, I still think they should win this game. Yeah. And yeah. I think I'm going to pick them to win. They're getting a touchdown at home. They're seven point favorites. And I think they should win by that. And they, sh they should really beat them by more. I just think they're a better team, but we've seen the Bengals kind of play down sometimes to their competition. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you saw yeah. way back in the early part of the year, they went down to Dallas with Cooper rush at the helm and they lost that game. They lost week well, one at home. I mean, they've lost some tough games. They lost in Baltimore. I mean, they've had some weird games, like a crush in Cleveland. Yeah, no, it's been a team that's been up and down all season and, for them, these next two games, because they have a bye next week, um, well, they, they might get this next one flexed out of Sunday night. Bengals, Steelers. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I might get flexed. But what I will say is, for the, as far as playing the Panthers um, this weekend, the Panthers are not a great offense. They, they really are. No. And if the Bengals lose this game, it's time to really, really, really pet, uh, press the panic button. You have no other option. Yeah, and I guess the good thing for them is they're still in the division because they're only one game back of Baltimore. Baltimore's at five or eight. The only problem for the Bengals is that they're 0-3 in the division. They've lost to every divisional team once so far this year, and that hurts. So the best they can do is 3-3 three and three in the division. And when you're in a division like that with a lot of teams kind of close to one another, I don't Craziness know. That's not, ensues. Yeah, that's not going to bode well. Maybe the tiebreakers work out somehow, but yeah, this is a game they definitely need, but Speaking of another team. No, really quickly, I want to say yeah. one more thing. About Go the ahead. Yeah. They need to start running the ball more. Exactly. That's what they need to start doing. They only ran it for eight times. And so I think that's like huge because it was only, and it was only, they only gave the ball to Joe Mixon eight times. If they can give it to Mixon, that opens up the play action. Listen, I know they won't have Jamar Chase because he's obviously a huge deep threat, but they still have T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd. They, they have to find another way to open up their offense. They're losing the deep threats, which they're so accustomed to, and they need to. Those usually opened up the run. Well, now they need to use the run to open up the pass. They need to kind of switch their, you know, their strategy a little bit. Yeah, they definitely have to do something because they've been up and down, but I think they can find a way to right the ship. They just got to tread water a little bit and then get some wins. But speaking of another team in the North, we're going to flip it to the mm -hmm. NFC North. And this is a team that's in complete free fall right now. The Green Bay Packers, they are traveling to Detroit for – uh NFC North showdown with the Lions and Green Bay is coming off of a tough Sunday night loss in Buffalo to the Bills. Um, only lost by 10, but it definitely felt like more of a blowout than that. And then on the other side, you have Detroit, who's just trying to find themselves. They're one in six. They've been competitive and they gave the Dolphins a pretty good fight last week. But at the end of the day, it's one of those teams where they have trouble just winning games and closing out games. But Obviously, I think this game is all about Green Bay. Can they finally just win and get back on track? Like, what do you think is going into this game? What's the key for Green Bay? Uh, I mean, geez, I don't even know. It's tough. About <laughs> it is such a train wreck. Um, I don't – there's so many problems, I think. First of all, the receiver situation is not great. Somebody's going to have to step up, and I'm not really sure where that's going to come from, especially considering the injury situation. Um, I they absolutely need Alan Lazard to play this week. I mean, if he plays, I at least feel a little bit better about their team because he's somebody I think Rodgers can trust. Um, but besides that, the the O line or the uh, the wide receiver and offense situation is not great. The O line is, eh, I think they they did a decent enough job against the Bills, but at the same time, the only way this team even is seems to be able to move the ball is when they're running. I mean, that's it. They're so reliant on running the ball. I mean, I feel like that's the only thing that they can do. Now, luckily for them, the Lions defense is horrible. Um, so that should help, especially with running the ball. They should definitely be able to run the ball and then establish the run and do well with the run. Because you're able to run against the Bills. You're probably able to run against the Lions. We know that. And so hopefully that leads to some play action down the field. Because I always felt like Rodgers, when he did play action, I always thought he was spectacular with that. And I think they need to kind of not simplify their offense a little bit, but they kind of need to go back to the bread and butter, play action, hey, down the field. And I think that's the thing for a lot of offenses. I think when things aren't working, they're I, sometimes I think they get too stuck on these coaches trying to run the same thing because they they see that something could work. But sometimes the, you know, 
the running of it doesn't go as planned. And there's a lot of, especially with a team like the Packers, where there's a lot of new guys and a lot of new receivers, especially with a veteran quarterback, there's going to be some issues. So they're going to have to find something. And I, I think it starts with running the ball and running the ball consistently too. Um, and I thought they did a better job of that in the second half against the Bills. I, I'm not sure what you really thought about their performance against the Bills. But the one, last point I want to say here really quickly, I think LaFleur has to be a little bit better. I haven't been too crazy with his play calls. Yeah, a really, little too so, cute maybe? Yeah, exactly. I think a little too cute is a great way to describe it. Um, yeah, you bring up how they played against Buffalo. I think their problem there was obviously Buffalo has a high-octane offense, so – they really had a lot of pressure out of the gate to score and they didn't really do that. So I think digging themselves in a hole is not what they want to do. It's not what any team wants to do, but I agree. I think they need to run the ball and they have the personnel to do it. AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones should be two guys that can carry the bulk of the load for the offense. And listen, they have a lot of deficiencies on the outside. And I was actually shocked. They didn't even make a move at the deadline because you saw guys move like chase Claypool. And he, I know he's suspended, but Calvin Ridley was moved from Atlanta to Jacksonville. I just think they could have gone out and maybe gotten a guy like that who maybe he's not a number one, but something close to a number one that can be a formidable target. I mean, I mean they didn't do anything. Right now. And they haven't really done anything in the last few years, and it's kind of been the mantra of the Green Bay management. They're just not going to get Rogers' help. So I guess they're going to have to try and right the ship, but I think they'll get it done. They should beat Detroit, but if they don't beat Detroit, that fan base is going to be burning up and falling. I don't, I don't know if it's 100% that they'll beat. Detroit. I, I don't know. I think it, it, depending on the Lions injury situation, because I know like Swift and right is questionable, and you know there's some other guys that have been a little banged up. But if DeAndre Swift plays, uh, I don't know. Watch yeah. out! I wouldn't be surprised if the Lions won. I just wouldn't. Yeah, and Green Bay's got a better defense, but they haven't really been playing up to their standards either. I mean, they've given up some high point totals to some teams with. You wouldn't think high octane offense. They uh, gave up 27, excuse me, to each of the New York teams. Yeah. And then they gave up 23 to Washington with the backup quarterback. Listen, 27 to Buffalo, that kind of sounds like a win. But oh, yeah, especially with the turnovers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You just got to get a win. I think that's the moral of the story there. But we're going to move on to another game in the one o'clock window. It's an interesting game. Not really talked about too much, I feel like, in this slate. But the Colts are traveling to Foxborough, take on the Patriots. And the Colts have been in the news. They made a QB change. They went to Sam Ellinger, and it did not go very well for them. They lost at home to the Commanders, which sent them to 3-4-1. and But on the flip side, New England, they are coming off a big road win at MetLife Stadium. They went down there, and they beat the Jets, a huge divisional win. And once again, it just continues to be the Patriots owning the Jets for the last few years, which maybe I thought the Jets could beat them this year. They'll have another chance to play them in Foxborough, but... I feel like the Jets could have beaten them just the way they've been playing, but it seems like a pretty even matchup on paper between the Colts and the Patriots. But yeah, what do you expect from this game? I feel like this is a game that New England should win, but you could also maybe see the Colts winning because you really don't know what you're going to get from the Colts each week. And the same could be said for the Patriots. Um, Well, let me start by saying I think the Colts are just an awful team. I mean, just nothing has worked for them this year, and I have no idea. Still, I'm surprised how they beat the Chiefs and. Uh, whatever uh, there's other wins that i'm surprised about for them as well um no jonathan taylor too i mean he's been kind of the disappointment of the season i think by a lot of people i mean this guy's had one touchdown this season one yeah actually coming touchdown. off the year that he allowed up last year you yes just, not, you never just see not expected um for the patriots i think it's going to be a lot of the same you're going to see ramadre stevenson get the ball you're going to see ramadre stevenson get the ball and you're going to see ramadre stevenson get the ball (laughs) and he's probably going to have a pretty nice game against the colts defense who you know gives up some runs like that's just the truth like they're not the the same Colts defense there's ways to beat them i mean in the past they had a pretty good defense but i'm just not just sure i'm just not sure they're the same at all they're just not and the whole team is kind of out of sorts. I really don't would not be surprised if Frank Reich gets fired after the season. It feels like the management has grown very impatient with him and the GM, too. Well, you bring up people potentially being fired. The Colts actually fired their offensive coordinator, Marcus Brady, in hoping that they're trying to get something some, to go some, right. Somebody got to get fired after that game. I mean, that was a train wreck. Yeah, I think this is one of those games that not a lot of people will tune into just because there's not really a lot of storylines here no. with the two teams. But if New England get a win, they go to five and four, they're kind of 
been writing the ship a little bit. They had a slow start. I think this could be a big win for them. They Typical could get it. Pat season, working towards, you know, a peak, right? I feel like they always start off not great. I don't know, the Pats, they look terrible. And the next thing you know, they're around 500, and now they're looking to get in the playoffs. Well, and you and saw this is by year. no means a talented roster. Like, I really do not like this roster at all. I think it's way worse than last year. Yeah, actually. and I was going to bring up how last year they were kind of hovering around 500 like they are now, and then they took off in the end of October and into November. They went on that long winning streak, and people were talking, oh, well, they're getting the one seed. They're going to have home field and all this. And then it kind of plateaus a little bit, and then they got blown out in Buffalo. But I agree. I just don't think – They don't have the firepower. That's they don't it. have the same roster. They don't have a lot of firepower on offense. but. I do think they're good enough to beat the Colts on Sunday, and that's why I'm going to pick them. But you never know what you're going to get from the Colts. But listen, I don't, I can't see. I think the Patriots are starting to just realize that running the ball has to be the focus of their team. And the Damian Harris is once again questionable. So if he's there too, that could be pretty good um, if they could get both those guys in. They also got a concern. I don't know if Kyle Duggar is going to play their safety. Right. All right. So we were going to talk about one more game before we go to break, but. We can squeeze it in here, I think. We have the Buffalo Bills going to MetLife to take on the New York Jets. Oh, yeah, let's squeeze it in because I have a question for you. At the end. So this is a big game for both teams. You have the Bills coming in at 6-1. and one. Well, the they... Jets lost the Super Bowl last week, so <laughs> I don't know. Ooh. So, yeah, I mean, you can call it whatever you want. Jets, Patriots, definitely a big game there. But Bills coming in at 6-1. and one. I mean, I don't think there's any surprise there. They've kind of handled their business they had that one slip up of Miami, but they've looked pretty good this year. They've obviously been a lot of people's Super Bowl pick. But on the flip side, you've got to talk about the surprising five and three record for the Jets. They won some games this year that not a lot of people thought they could win. They won in Green Bay. They won some other games. But they're coming in this game as massive home underdogs. And I don't think a lot of people are giving them a shot, but I think Jet fans are believing that they can I win but disagree i disagree i have not heard one jets fan after last week tell me something positive i going in the last week it was this year's different this year's different well that that ended real quick because i have not heard a single ounce of confidence from any jets fan and i think it starts with zach wilson because if you watched the jets game last week against the patriots i think listen you don't want to blame losses on one guy but it just was no. so clear that Zach Wilson did not have a great game last Three week. picks is unacceptable. And I think the mantra with him is that he sometimes likes to get too cute and careless with the football where he thinks he can make pretty much any throw on the field and he throws off his back foot or he's on the run and then that's when the other team gets the ball. But I think if he can limit the turnovers and stuff like that, I think they can have a chance to win this game. It's just I don't know how they're going to keep up with Buffalo. Buffalo is a really high-powered offense. and. Listen, I think Buffalo is going to come in and try to make a statement. I think they're going to continue to try to put their foot in the gas pedal. And they know this is a big game. This is a divisional game on the road. And there's a lot of stakes going in this game. But I just think Buffalo is too much. I think they're going to win by like 10 or 14. I still think it's going to be one of those games where the Jets, honestly, they could have some chances to hang around because there have been some instances where Buffalo's offense has been human. But I just think they're too much. They have a lot of weapons. Yeah, I'm. Listen, here, here's the thing for the Jets: they lose Brees Hall, and I understand it's a big loss. Um, but it was always going to come down to whether or not Zach Wilson performed this season. That's the truth, right? Like you needed Zach Wilson to take that next step if this team was going to go somewhere. Now the defense appears like it's playing pretty well. You know, obviously last week not great, but they uh, they get they get they. Welcome back to WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle with Jimmy Cody and Jeffrey Bozzi. We were talking some NFL and MLB before the break, but we're going to continue with the NFL slate for week nine. We also will get into some college football at the end of the show, but we're going to pick up where we left off here, previewing the week nine slate and giving our thoughts and picks. So we're going to talk about now the Minnesota Vikings. They've been a quiet six and one team in the nfc they are leading the nfc north by a pretty sizable margin i think they're up three games on the rest of their teams in the division but they will travel to the nation's capital at least in the area because the commanders play in landover maryland they will take on the washington commanders sorry for a little details here but 
They'll take on the Commanders in an interesting game because the Commanders are four and four themselves, and I don't think a lot of people view them as a good team. And I still don't think they're like a great team, but no. they have shown they can get wins. And it's crazy because they're winning without Carson Wentz, who was their day one starter, but he's gone down with an injury. So now Taylor Heineke is once again taking the reins. But Jimmy, coming into this game, Minnesota is only favored by three. I think there's a little respect for the Commanders there, but. Do you expect the Vikings just to continue their success? Or do you think Washington actually has a chance on pulling off a mini upset here? Well, here's the thing. Um, the Vikings made some moves this week. Obviously, they traded for TJ Hawkinson, and they solidified their offense once again. Um, the biggest question for me still remains their defense. However, I think that their defense has played relatively solid this season um, compared to what it was in the past. And I think they've also done a better job of running the football and kind of controlling the clock, especially when they know that they have a lead. Um, going forward, though, with the commanders, I, I kind of like what I see out of Heineke. I feel like it's just a different vibe with the team and whatnot. And it seems like they can actually play a little bit when they do have them in there. Now, with that said, they have a lot of guys out. They have Jahan Dodson out. That's you know a little bit tough not having Dodson. Um, but they do have other guys. They have Scary Terry, right? We know Terry McLaurin. He, him and Taylor Heineke have had a pretty good connection. That's the truth. And it's been nice to kind of see, you know, Washington Commanders offense do something. It's been nice to see that. Yes. Uh, going forward, though, I, I really don't know how good the Vikings are. But if they win this game like they're supposed to and they're 7-1, and one, I mean, what, what can bad can you really say about them? I mean... It's seven and one is impressive no matter the feat, right? Um, no matter where it, is, it comes from and no matter who you're beating, it's still impressive to be seven and one. Now, their only loss came against the Eagles, but it was a complete no show. So I still have that in the back of my mind. Uh, but with that being said, I think the Vikings are the better team here. Um, I, I don't know what you think about the commanders, but I definitely agree with what you were saying before. I don't think that they're a great team um or i know you said that you don't think people think that they're a great team and i agree with that i don't think that they're a great team yeah the four and four record i mean you can say what you want i mean they've won four games they've lost four games they've been somewhat in the middle and you know what they've gotten hot recently they had a ugly win in chicago on a thursday night they stunned the world when they beat green bay i thought that was kind of an impressive one and then even last week, they go on the road and they get a win in Indy, which is yeah, sometimes in a row. sometimes a tough place to play. But the Colts have obviously had their troubles this year. But I think the thing for the commanders that really hurts them is they don't really run the ball like at all. No, I'm looking here. Their leading rusher on the year is Antonio Gibson. And he, coming into the year, was a guy who maybe could bounce back because he's had some good years in the past. He's pretty good in 2020. But he's only rushed for 292 yards in the season. And then I just think on the flip side, in terms of this game, I think Minnesota offensively just is going to overpower them. But listen, their defense is not out of this world. I mean, I think their defense can be susceptible to big plays. And I think Heineke's capable of getting out of the pocket and hitting guys like you said, Terry McLaurin down the field. That being said, I do think Minnesota is going to squeak out a win. But I would not be surprised if Washington somehow finds a way to win. If they win this game, they go to five and four. There, I mean, they're right in the wild card mix. I mean, yeah, you're totally. They would right. still be in striking distance of the Eagles too. Only they would be only three back, and they play each other next week, the Commanders and the Eagles. So, yeah, I think Minnesota wins. But let's go to another game, the final one o'clock game in the window. Go a little faster here, just in the interest of time. Sorry, I'm talking a little too much, but got the Raiders and the Jaguars, two two win teams going head to head, and. Obviously, the Raiders have been disappointing. I think the Jags coming in this year weren't going to do much, but they started off well. They had a few wins and then kind of fallen off a little bit. They obviously are coming off that loss in London to your Denver Broncos, but I think this is more about the Raiders personally. But what do you see in this game? Well, the Raiders' offense needs to have a bounce back. Devontae Adams needs to have more than one catch for three yards, that's for sure. I think that's all you need to say. And I don't know if that's maybe on him or Derek Carr or Josh McDaniels. I think it is responsibility. Everywhere. All three. Yeah. The O-line hasn't been great. I think they have by far. The defense gives up a lot of big plays too. Yeah, they have a lot of things going wrong for them. And I would have to do a little more thought on this, but I think by far they've been the most disappointing team this year, the Raiders. I mean, they've been bad. Yeah. I, I would have to give it more thought just because I don't have the time I mean, to right I now. I think the Bucks and the Rams are a little more disappointing. But I agree. The I Broncos think those have two been teams disappointing. Are, uh, the Colts have been disappointing. The Packers have been disappointing. A lot of disappointing teams. Yeah, a lot of the NFC powerhouses from last year have been disappointing. I just think on the AFC side, 
the Raiders have had this slow start, and I don't know, frankly, they're going to get out of it. No. I think this would be a good week to do it, because this is a game they should win. But also, Jacksonville, they've played up to competition. I mean, they can show that they can play with some big boys. I mean, they beat L.A. They almost beat the Eagles. They've had some decent wins. But I don't know. I just think the Raiders, if they're hitting with their talent, they have talent on offense. If they just use it, I think they should win. Yeah, and it's a 1 o'clock game, though. It's a West Coast team going to a East Coast 1 o'clock. I mean, that's not always great. But the Eagles, the Raiders really struggled with it last week. Wonder what they're doing differently this week to try and avoid that. Yep, and now we're going to flip it to the other coast. We have an NFC West showdown in the desert between the Seattle Seahawks and the Arizona Cardinals, the lone 405 game on the Sunday slate. Seattle coming in at 5-3. and three. They are in first place in the NFC West, which I don't think anyone saw coming. And then on the other side, you have Arizona at 3-5. and five. Team coming into the year, coming off a playoff appearance. They're trying to find their way. And they've kind of been dysfunctional in a little bit of ways. But yeah, you got to be impressed with Seattle, Jimmy. I would think that they come in probably thinking they can win, even though they're not favored to. Oh, absolutely. I, I would I would think the Seahawks have a chance to win here for sure. Um, I know that the money is coming in on the Cardinals right now because they are the favorites. And, you know, some people that might be surprising. But I think the, the story about the Seahawks is like they win these games, but how good are they? We don't really know, right? Um, I think that's kind of the, the whole thing about where they're at right now. Uh, Geno Smith's obviously been very good, but – I think the focus for this Arizona team, especially, needs to be running the ball, controlling the clock, and then getting passes to DeAndre Hopkins. That has to be the focus here because if they are a train wreck on offense, Seattle's just going to hold the ball, run the ball, because the Cardinals' defense, let's be honest, not that great. Not that great. The Seahawks will be able to score on the Cardinals. The Cardinals' offense is really the key for them. And I'm, I was going to flip that point, actually. I think the same can be true on the other side. I think the Cardinal offense can score in the Seahawks' defense. It's just you don't know what Seahawks' defense you're going to get because they have given up some big numbers this year. They gave up 45 in Detroit. They gave up 39 in New Orleans. But they've also played the Cardinals before, and they only gave up nine. So I don't know what we're going to get there. But I do know I think it's going to be a pretty entertaining game. So get your popcorn for that. But Rams box is the other four o'clock game in the 425 slot. Uh, you would think this would be a great game coming in, but both teams sitting at three and four, three and five. Both teams have definitely been very disappointing. Who do you like here? Because both teams have not only really shown you that you can trust either one of them. And I think it starts with the quarterbacks. Yeah, when it comes down to Rams box, um, there's just so many problems on both sides of the ball that, just gets me. Let's start with the Rams offense. Obviously, Cooper Cup's a little banged up. That's not great to start off with. Their running back situation is a nightmare. Their O line is not the same as it was last year. They just have different players and it's just not as good. And then their quarterback has struggled too. And then also, their defense is not as dominant. So it's just not the same Rams team at all. Uh, looking at the Bucs, well, this isn't the same team either. We just saw Shaquille Barrett. He's out, uh, torn Achilles. That's a killer for the Bucs. We also know that the O-line is not the same. They've been dealing with some injuries. They're kind of putting guys together and whatnot, and it's not looking good. Um, you can put this on the Bucks offense as much as you want, um, but the truth is, is they're not as good on defense either. No, they've had injuries all over the place. Brady obviously is dealing with off-the-field stuff, but he hasn't looked the same. I think he's showing his age a little bit more than he's used to, and the thing with the Rams, Stafford just had a lot of interceptions this year, and that's not going to really help the team. And I feel like they're still in a hangover. And all that being said, I still think Tampa Bay wins. I mean, just because they're at home, somebody's got to win this game. But, but I'm I picking really, that with a grain of salt. Yeah, I really don't know who it would be. I, I really don't trust either of these teams at all. Yeah, there might be a little revenge in their mind too, just because LA beat them in the playoffs last year, but. Love to see. It's going to be an interesting game. And then the final game of the Sunday slate, we'll preview the Monday night game on Monday, but this is actually probably my most exciting game that I'm excited to watch. The Tennessee Titans and the Kansas City Chiefs. It's a very interesting matchup because both teams, believe it or not, are five and two. And coming in here, the Titans, they traded away A.J. Brown. They lost Julio Jones. And I don't know. Obviously, everything goes through King Henry, but I don't think a lot was going to be said about them this year. They could win the South, but I didn't think they were really contender and then you got Kansas City they run in the back with Patrick Mahomes their offense really hasn't missed too much of a beat without Tyree Kill but I just wanted to ask you Jimmy what do you think is going to be the key for the Titans if they're going to pull off a stunner because 
I do think they have a recipe where they actually can do it. It's just, I think offensively, if they're gonna have to throw a lot, can Tannehill get it done? And I know you're not the biggest Ryan Tannehill fan, and I'm not either. Well, I don't even. Oh, is it 100 percent sure that Ryan Tannehill's gonna play? I don't oh, know that's true. That's right. But I think yeah. It's, it's up so if there. it is Malik Willis, if it's Malik Willis, I do you I, still give them a shot? Listen, I think the game plan would have been the same either way. It would have been run the ball, run the ball, run the ball some more. And they have to control the clock. They cannot let the Mahomes offense just go off for 34, 35, 40 something points. Like that's not going to be able to get it done for the Saints because frankly, they just don't score enough and they don't have the big plays enough to, to keep up. Um the, the the key for me is the Titans defense. They have to keep them in the game. They're gonna have their its defense has done okay this season. But they're really going to have to step up in, in this game to give the team a chance, especially if it's Malik Willis at quarterback. Yeah, and I brought up Tannehill just because he missed up la- missed last week's game against the Texans, and then there's a somewhat of a rumor he could play, but he had, did not practice yesterday. So I would probably guess that he's not going to play. So if it is Malik Willis, there is a little bit of element of surprise there. I mean, he can run, and Tannehill really can't run like as well as Malik Willis. He can run a little bit, but. I just think Kansas City has too much offense. You're right. I just don't know if they can really keep up through the air. They can definitely do it on the ground, but through the air is a question mark. So, But doesn't this just give you the vibe of, like, Tennessee, nobody believes in them, and then they're just going to come out and randomly play well? Yeah. I mean, how many times have they done that? And they did it, I believe. Twice last year, I can think of, when they played the Rams. I was going to say, when they played the Rams, that was a game no one gave them a shot. And then they played the Bills, too. And they beat them, yeah. And they beat them, too, on Monday night, but, yeah. Uh, I think Kansas City wins, but don't be surprised if those Tennessee Titans find a way to get out of there with a win. So we have four minutes left, and we're going to stay with football. We're just going to shift it to the collegiate side because we haven't really touched on it too much, but not sure if any of our listeners caught the college football playoff rankings that were revealed earlier this week, but the first set of rankings were revealed, and I think there's some conversation that needs to be had because the top four that was revealed, and I'll go in the order here, we have Tennessee at number one, Ohio State at number two, Georgia at number three, and Clemson at number four. And we have Michigan and Alabama following them at five and six, respectively. So I'll offer my brief thoughts first, and I'll give you the mic, Jimmy. I thought Tennessee at one was kind of a statement because they looked pretty good this year, but have they looked like the best team? I think that's a question that still needs to be answered, and I think it could be answered this weekend as they go up against Georgia. I was surprised that Clemson was over Michigan. I thought Michigan this year's looked pretty well or pretty good. That's the wrong word to say, but they've had a few scares. I feel like they barely got by Florida State, and look, Florida State's a good team, but they squeaked by Clemson, or excuse me, they Clemson squeaked by Syracuse, and they had a shootout against Wake Forest that they won. I just thought Michigan's overall body of work was just a little bit better than Clemson, so that was the only complaint I have it I don't really have any other complaints listen Ohio State and Georgia you could make an argument they're better than Tennessee but what do you think about the top four well I think those are the correct teams I mean I, I think what they're essentially saying by putting Ohio State there and not Michigan and also having um you know Georgia there it's basically like whoever wins these conferences is going to be the one who's in there at the end of the day because I think that's what we're heading towards yeah and we brought up Tennessee and Georgia they are facing each other this week on the 330 CBS game. And I believe the game is at Georgia. It so is. that's a big home field advantage for them. Tennessee coming in to the game, they definitely have a high powered offense. I mean, you've seen Herndon Hooker. He can really play. He gets a really good deep ball and he can make plays with his legs. But Georgia coming off the championship last year, they've kind of had just same old, same old. They play pretty good defense and the offense is just, I don't know, good functional offense. And Listen, they had the one scare against Missouri, but they've kind of righted the ship. Besides that, they crushed Auburn. They crushed Vanderbilt. They crushed Florida. So they're riding in with the momentum. They crushed Kentucky. They crushed LSU. Kentucky, too. Yeah, and Kentucky and LSU are, too. I'm talking about Tennessee. Well, yeah, Tennessee, you could talk about them. They've beaten some good teams recently. Two teams just coming in on fire is what I'm trying to say. And you brought up LSU, and we brought up Bama, Alabama, that is, earlier. They play each other, actually, so that's a – top 10 matchup that is also happening top 25 matchup you mean well so i bring up top 10 because alabama is six and lsu is 10 in the college football playoff rankings so i'm just going off of that and yeah yeah who would have thought lsu would be a 10 yeah i I was a little bit of an i'm very surprised with that one and 
I guess I'll just ask you just in the interest of time, because there are some other games that are good. Texas, Kansas State, you bring up Wake Forest, NC State, but I want to talk about this. Tennessee, game. Georgia is the feature game, not just of the week, but I think it's the game of the year just on if, paper. Well, I don't know. The Alabama, Tennessee game, I think might have been up there too. Right. I think this is just for the magnitude of what this could be. I think this is going to be a really good game. Who do you like? I like Georgia. I mean, Georgia at home, I, I think their defense is a little bit better. Um, I, I just, I know Tennessee beating Alabama is a great win and I, uh, Listen, I, I have no doubts about that, but I think Georgia would beat Alabama. Yeah, it's a really tough game to pick because I like Tennessee's offense more than Georgia, but I like Georgia's defense more than Tennessee. I'm going to go with the stunner. I think Tennessee goes in there, and I think it's somewhat of a shootout, somewhere in the 30s, maybe in the 40s. I think Tennessee squeaks it out. They get a game-winning field goal at the buzzer, and they hold on to number one ranking. But I could be wrong. I mean – it's going to be a really good game, you know, I think. You know what the most surprising part of this is? Georgia is an eight-point favorite at home. Yeah, so I guess they really like Georgia, they being Vegas. We'll have to see. It's going to be a great game. There's going to be a lot of more of these games down the road. I mean, Ohio State-Michigan is over the Thanksgiving break. There's so many other games that are going to be of this magnitude, but this is a really good one that we're going to have Saturday. So Plus, whoever wins the SEC East and SEC West is going to play each other in the championship. Right. You got the SEC, the Big Ten. There's some – Lot Big 12 has been good this year. There's a lot of good teams in the middle there, too, that could end up being in some decent bowl game slots. But we'll get into all that as the time comes. But thank you all for listening to today's show. We really appreciate it. We went through a lot, and uh, we'll be back on Monday. We'll be talking some football, wrapping up some baseball, and uh, maybe diving into some college football, college basketball starts, NBA, NHL. You got it all. We'll see you Monday.